All right. Hey, good morning, everyone. It's great to see. Uh, I think this is the most people we have had at one point, even on our first day. So uh, if you're new, welcome. If you've returned or have any questions, feel free to reach out. But we are currently on Chapter 6 with Aaron, and uh, he presented last week on Chapter 5. Uh, but all the recordings and the material should be in the GitHub or on YouTube now. Uh, if you have questions or need to go over anything, let us know. Apologize, my camera's off. I have my daughter here, just don't want her on the camera. And um, next week, I will be presenting Chapter 7, where we'll actually be drawing what Aaron's covering today. If you have a chance to look at the uh, sign-up sheet to volunteer for upcoming, I see a few people have uh, selected. But other than that, if you feel like there's a topic of interest or something that you want to present, feel free to um, um, uh, sign up. It's be a great experience, uh, even if you're not too familiar. It's a good practice and a good way to reinforce you know the topic. So, uh, with that, if there's any questions or anything, we can answer those now. Otherwise, uh, Aaron, it's, it's 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 for you. Great, thanks, John. Appreciate the intro. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, yeah, we're talking about Chapter Six in the Effect this week. Uh, focuses on causal diagrams or DAGs, uh, directed acyclic graphs. And uh, just a high level overview uh, of learning objectives this week. Uh, first and foremost, what do we mean when we talk about causality? What does that term mean? We uh, shed some light on that in this chapter. Um, then we go through the basic mechanics of, of a DAG, how that's created, um, and how that summarizes um, what we're really interested in, which is the data generating process, DGP for short, uh, which we've covered in previous chapters. Uh, a little uh, extra bit that I introduced this week that's not explicitly talked about in the, in the book is, well, how do you draw? I know <laughs> next week's chapter is about drawing DAGs, but you kind of have to know a little bit about that this week as well. Um, I, uh, I, I research how to basically draw a DAG in R um, again, it's not really discussed in the chapter, but uh, a popular library for doing so is GD, ggdag. And um, so I'll show just some high-level code about how, how you can use that library to produce, produce some DAGs. Uh, and then we'll, we'll talk about how you analyze a DAG. Uh, really, uh, the DAG can help you focus on which variation you're interested in. Uh, which variation you're not. Um, and so while we don't cover it in this chapter, really the main point is we want to block uh, the variation uh, that doesn't answer our research question. Um, so we can look at that in the DAG uh, to give us a strategy of, of what we need to do to, to, to block out that variation that is not of interest. Uh, and, and then finally, we, we talk about a couple interesting concepts. Uh, one is just these unobserved or latent variables uh that we that may be part of this data generating process we still want to capture that in our dag um, and then there's this concept of moderating variables uh, which really has to do with interaction uh, between you know two or more uh, variables so starting with the the first section here on causality uh you know what do we mean by the the term causal or, or causality, uh, we know that most research questions involve <laughs> causality of some sort. They're causal in nature. Um, you, you know, a typical data science problem might be interested in correlation, right, between two variables. You think of a lot of the advances in, in AI recently with large language models, and, and really that's about prediction, not about causal relationships. But you know, for, for in the social sciences in particular, you know, you're you're trying to identify the why, why something happens. The examples given in the book are: you know, does increasing the minimum wage actually reduce poverty? Um, and another one was: if if you take a cold medicine, does it actually reduce your recovery time? Or, you know, the, the time that you're you're sick, does that decrease as a result of taking the cold medicine? So those are really interesting questions. Um, that you can't answer through simple uh, correlations. 
uh, and there's a an interesting framework for thinking about causality. We'll, we'll go over in a, in a minute here, but the author starts off by talking about phrases that suggest causality, other terms that maybe aren't uh, causal in nature, and then what he calls weasel terms, <laughs> which are this gray area. They, they can be, in, in some cases, I think intentionally misleading to imply causality where really there is none. And so we'll, we'll start with terms that we use to describe causality and some of these are, are pretty obvious, right? Like cause, <laughs> causes, X causes Y. Uh, that's that's a, a clear clear cut. We're talking about you know something causal in nature, uh, but other terms, effects, uh, you know, a, a variable increases or decreases another variable. X leads to Y. You know, one variable determines another. Uh, you know, a variable improves another. Uh, Variable X is responsible for variable Y. These are pretty explicit uh, that there's a, a causal relationship at play. On the other hand, you, you know, you might read a headline in a news article, right, saying something is associated with 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 something else. And and when we use the term association, we think correlation. Uh, that does not imply causation. Uh, related would be another term, uh, also is not necessarily indicative of a causal relationship or uh, tend to occur or not to incur together. Uh, again, we're, we're just using uh, synonyms here for, for correlation. Uh, where things get a little tricky is, is with these loaded terms like linked. Um, when I hear the word linked, I think of causal link, right? It's, it's almost implied there. Um, so it, it's not explicitly saying there's a causal relationship, but I think there's just this idea in our heads that when you hear link, uh, there's, there's, there's something causal at play. Um, and uh, something that was noted in the chapter was that weasel, these weasel phrases or terms tend to imply a direction uh, and, and causal relationships do have direction associated with them. Um, so you, you see this term here followed by you know, X is followed by Y, that, that almost implies that X causes Y, um, even though we're not really explicitly saying that here. So just be careful with terms like that. Uh, has ramifications for us is kind of <laughs> similar to the, the followed by. Um, people who are X are more likely to Y. Again, there's this direction where it's like X happens first and then Y. Um, suggesting that because there's a, a temporal thing at play, then there's there's a cause and effect uh, relationship at stake where there there might not be. Any uh, any questions on on this part here, just about terms we use for causality versus non causality, and then that that gray area or misleading uh, set of terms. All right. Uh, hearing no feedback, we'll move along here. And so we can talk about the definition of causality now. And, and so I'll, I'm just quoting from, from the book here. Uh, the, the way you really want to think about it is if, if you can perform an intervention or think in, in your head, if, if you could perform an, an experiment, you might have a, a causal framework at play here. And so, you know, the, the, the phrase, the, the, the passage from the book, it says, we can say that X causes Y. Um, if, if we were to intervene, change the value of X, um, then the distribution of Y would also change as a result. Um, so again, if we could, we could imagine an intervention at stake, even though we're, we're primarily dealing with observational, uh, data, then, then we, we may have this, this cause effect, um, situation. Uh, interesting question uh, that was a sidebar. Uh, in this chapter was, can we establish causality in cases where we can't actually manipulate um, in the real world? Um, and, and an example would be race. That was That's what was given, in, right? We can't change someone's race. That's something you're born with. Um, and so this is, this is, I guess, maybe a rhetorical question uh, that the author kind of gives out. Can, can we, it, it, is it possible to establish this cause and effect, even if you can't in a, for, for all practical purposes, manipulate uh, this variable, which is race. Um, 
And interestingly enough, uh, there's apparently a lot of healthy debate on this kind of sub subject, but you know, we're, we're kind of told that yes, you, you still can, um, you know, uncover cause and effect relationships, even, even in situations like this, where you can't in, in all practical purposes, manipulate the, the variable of interest. Um, I'm interested if, if anyone on this call has had situations like that, or do you agree with the author? I guess I, I, I'm interested to hear more about the situation in general, but um, I think I just need to go a little deeper um, on that particular uh, situation. I mean, I guess I agree with the author. Um, I'm a biologist, and mm -hmm. while experimentation is possible in biology, a lot of the times it's just very much is not. <laughs> um, so, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I definitely think that it requires probably a bigger body of evidence to support that causal relationship than if you can just like do an experiment and you're done um which of course is an oversimplification like you, you don't generally draw a conclusion based off of a single experiment but um i do think it's possible i just think that yeah maybe the maybe the body of evidence has to be greater in order to sort of feel confident in the causal link yeah yeah and i i think something that was introduced last week and, and we talk about this week as well is you know when you're dealing with the observational data everything rests on your assumptions and so you need to be very explicit about what those assumptions are that's what the dag is really it's just an explicit listing of your uh, assumptions so you you might be able to say that a cause and effect relationship exists given these assumptions but you need to kind of put out there for the world to see here are my assumptions because folks are going to pick that apart <laughs> and um you know, at the end of the day, you want that because you end up with, I think, better better research, right, long term. If if you you state that others others can can pull, you know tear it apart a little bit, and so you can kind of revise that research process, and you come up with a, a better conclusion in the end. Um, yeah. So we we talk about the the concept of intervening on a variable, and uh, examples would be the penicillin, right, introduced to a petri dish. Um, versus maybe not introducing the penicillin, right, uh, uh, into into this dish that has bacteria in it. Um, and so we can see whether or not the introduction of the, the, the penicillin causes bacteria to die. So in, in that situation, that's maybe a clear cut, you know, experiment that you could perform. Um, so maybe not a directly applicable to the more observational uh, situations that we more commonly encounter here. Uh, but the second example is more observational in nature, where you can still envision uh, intervening. Uh, and this was an example we talked about, I think, last week or the week before, right? So we noticed there's a correlation between e consuming ice cream and um, wearing shorts. And um, you might want to see, like, well, does wearing shorts actually induce ice cream eating behavior? And so you could technically perform some sort of experiment, you know, just think about that in your head, right? <laughs> have people, I'm going to assign them shorts and, and see what their uh, ice cream uh, consumption looks like versus someone that you might just assign pants. Um, so again, I think that, that gets to that causal framework. You can, can imagine intervening on the variable shorts, yes or no, um, and kind of seeing what happens from there. And then lastly, the, the third example given in the book was about uh, cigarettes um, and intervening on the price uh, charged for cigarettes, seeing how that uh, influences health. And this example is a little bit more nuanced because uh, you know the, the 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 price of cigarettes does not have a direct link to health, but it does have a direct link to consumption. Right, the the higher the price of you're charging for a pack of cigarettes. Uh, presumably, the the less folks will consume, the less folks consume, um, you know, the the more of an impact on one's health uh, you'll you'll see out in the in the wild. Um, so so that's just um, an indirect link, and uh, we're kind of hinting at what the DAG is here because you can see these arrows 
showing you that, you know, price of cigarettes influences consumption, which influences health. And that's really what the, uh, the causal diagrams are uh, attempting to do there. Uh, and then finally, just we, we talk about prob probability and causality. So um, you do not have to have a deterministic relationship uh, to prove that that um, a causal relationship exists. And by that, I mean, um, you know, you intervene on a certain variable. Uh, the impact on the outcome variable does not have to happen necessarily 100% of the time. Uh, the example given in the book, I think was with the, the light switch, right? Like most of the time, if you, if, if the lights are on, you flip the, the light switch, you would expect the lights to turn off, but, uh, there are going to be cases where that doesn't work because your light bulb maybe burns out as you flip the switch, for instance. Um, and so the idea is here is that the intervention really just changes the probability distribution of the outcome of interest. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean 100% of the time, again, that uh, you'll get a certain result. Um, and so this is really important in uh, uh, the social sciences, right? Where uh, a lot of times you're dealing with money or human behavior and, and human behavior related to money. <laughs> um, if you're thinking economics or, or just, you know, sociology, anthropology, et cetera, or maybe it's just behavior in general. And, you know, it, it's nuanced and, you know, you just have a, an intervention, it doesn't doesn't mean folks are gonna behave a certain way every time. Uh, and then before we move on to the final piece, there there's a, another interesting sidebar about the legal definition of causality. Um, you know, in 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 a, in a court of law, you think about like litigation. Um, that's not really a probabilistic issue. I, you know, if if you uh, it's the winter time and you have an icy sidewalk and your neighbor slips and falls and, and breaks their leg on your sidewalk, um, that's a clear cut cause and effect, <laughs> right? Or you you could you could establish that cause and effect relationship presumably in the in the court of law there, um, right? But if your neighbor walked on your slippery uh, sidewalk but did not fall right there was still the hazard there that your neighbor could fall but but he or she didn't so there, that's a probabilistic issue um so there was an increased probability of fall but because it didn't happen right there's not really a legal case there um so uh, I, again i thought that it was a really interesting contrast there can um, i uh feel free to tell me if i'm off or need to push this over the opposite of that and how it applies for like insurance Mm -hmm. where they use like that to basically rate you. So like if your father or mother died at 35 because of a medical accident or something off, like that's sometimes used to determine whether you get coverage for life insurance or something like that, or the rate or whatever, because you sort of just curious how the opposite of that is where it's like, it treats it like it's a casual thing. Like because your parent died at 35 because they got hit by a bus walking across the street that you're now a higher risk of dying at 35. So that seems like an uh, opposite of that approach where mm -hmm. they're using something that likely wouldn't have happened like they would have lived past 35, except this event happened. Yeah, I, I would just say there again, <laughs> it, it, good questions, particularly because I, I work in insurance, right? Uh, that really weren't, uh, you know, the insurance mathematicians, right? They're not really looking at cause and effect. It's really about the correlations. Okay. So uh, yeah, it, it is really about the association there. Um, obviously it's a higher barrier to establish cause and effect that that's interesting i, I don't know if like did you, did you say hit by a bus kind of situation you had a parent that was hit by a bus oh i i didn't know just saying something like out there but um but I certainly remember. like chronic conditions right we think of diabetes right if you have a family member um that suffers from diabetes you know there's there's going to be a genetic predisposition there um right so there, there's a correlation uh but but cause and effect is, is kind of a, a different different uh, item there, right? That, that's not really necessary for coming up with a, an appropriate premium rate. Fair enough, okay. All right, so uh, we're moving into causal diagrams. 
interestingly enough, um, well, there's a, a couple folks you see referenced with regard to causal inference. Uh, one of them is, I think, is it Donald Rubin, who I think was maybe the uh, kind of forefather of this field. And now more in a more modern world, it's, it's Judea Pearl. Uh, and he, in the mid nineties, came up with the, the concept of uh, DAGs um, in the mid mid nineties. And interestingly enough, the, the original use case was about incorporating causality into ar artificial intelligence, um, which seems very prescient now, right? Since artificial intelligence is all the rage. And, you know, you just think about artificial intelligence today and it's mostly about just predictions, right? It's not cause and effect. I, I know there's a sub a subfield out there that's AI and, and causal inference, but I don't think that's, when you think of popular applications, it's, it's not that. And I think there's probably um, a lot more to come there. Um, but, but this is interesting because the, those ideas, right? Causality and artificial intelligence are, have existed for many decades now. Um, cause we, we think of a lot of this stuff as new, but, uh, I guess some of the seeds have been planted, uh, a long time ago here and we're still making a lot of progress. Uh, all right. So, uh, two parts to, uh, a, a, a DAG. Uh, um, and that's your, your uh, nodes. I'm going to scroll down here. Um, I did draw these in R, by the way. Uh, these two balls here represent your nodes, which are your variables. Um, and then you have, what do I have? Um, causal relationship, uh, which is this uh, arrow here. So the if you think of graph theory, you have nodes and edges. And... Um, the arrow points from the, the variable that's causing the effect. So um, we'll talk through this particular example, but the coin flip is causing a uh, cake here. So we, we go from coin flip to cake. Um, the, the, sp the specific example here is that the setup is it's you and a friend, Brad. Uh, you both want to eat the same slice of cake. There's only one, one slice left. You flip a coin. Uh, if it lands on heads, you get the cake. If it lands on tails, Brad gets the cake. And so, you know, the coin flip is causing, you know, who gets to eat the cake. Uh, and so just real quick here um, in R, I, you know, this is a basic example of how you would create this. The GG DAG library is, is, it seems to be pretty popular. It sits on top of GG plot. Um, so the core function here is just a DAGify. Um, so on your left here, it, this is a typical, uh, formulaic relationship that you see, like in a linear model in R, uh, where on the left-hand side, you, you think of your, uh, dependent variable, um, right-hand side, you think of your explanatory variables. So it's, it's similar here where you have the variables that are causing the effect would be on the right-hand side. So this is the coin flip on the right, on the left is cake because the coin flip, you know, um, affected the, the cake consumption, you know, who consumed the cake in this example. Um, you can uh, apply this uh, function without specifying coordinates of where your nodes are, but it tends to look messy just from, you know, my brief experimentation. So you basically want to create a list of um, where your nodes are going to be. So it's, it's not too difficult. And then um, in some cases, in simple examples, you don't even have to instantiate like the gg plot function you can just say gg dag uh, apply that to your dagify object that you applied earlier and then you have a, a nice little little dag here so i'll leave that for folks uh hopefully that's that's helpful um in later chapters if you want to draw a dag as opposed to just copying and pasting uh the examples from the from the book because i it doesn't look like he used a common r library to produce uh the the textbook examples yeah in the uh chapter seven in the little side part, he put the site in its a specific R package, but at the bottom they have uh, other resources they would recommend checking out. And the one you're using is like the top one that's on there. So there's a variety of them and there's one for Jupyter notebooks for Python as well. Sure. And Shiny. Do you, uh, so you're saying he, he did use an R package uh, to create this? Uh, for the casual diagram one, he recommended either just drawing them or using the website that's provided and some of these actually have like ones that you can interact with like on a on a site and build that way I see. but there are some R packages gotcha. that he references and other resources yeah, yeah. to use them as well 
Gotcha. I posted that in the link, so if anyone wants to take a look ahead of next week. Yeah, good to know. Thank you. Uh, just a, a couple uh, points here. The the DAG is is pretty simple. It doesn't give you all of the details about how things are are, are going to work. Um, you think about a flow chart where you have different outcomes of a variable, and then it spins off into multiple directions. Like if this variable equals yes, then you do something else. If it equals no, we we go in this other direction. Those details are not included in a DAG. Um, so you have one node for each variable. Um, regardless, you know, if, if it's a categorical variable, you wouldn't include all those levels uh, underlying that that variable. You would just include it it once. Um, so, so you don't, you, you know, it's it's a very very high level. Um, we, we do know the direction from cause to effect. That's one of the key, key things that the DAG is showing. Um, but it doesn't really tell you the the magnitude of the, the effect. Is it strong or a weak effect? Um, it, it doesn't give you the sign of the effect. And by that, I mean, like, is the effect that, you know, in this case, like cake consumption, does it increase or decrease, for instance? It, you don't know about that. That's not what the DAG is intended to do. It's just really about what is causing other things in, in this uh, DGP, the data generating process. Uh, and then uh, one more call out, you can ignore anything um, that is caused by the outcome variable of interest. You know, assuming you have this this research question, you're interested in this outcome variable. A anything that kind of happens beyond that, right? Like the, the the outcome variable then does this other stuff to these other variables are really not uh, in, important. Okay, so we continue with the uh, coin flipping example, uh, and ju just to give a little bit more complexity to this diagram, and. You know, we still have the coin flip and the, and the cake, but now we have our friend uh, Terry, <laughs> who might walk, might or might not walk into the room. And so the situation is a little bit more complex in that if you win uh, the the coin toss, then you have to give the coin to Brad. That's the only way he'll accept the the bet. Um, and then if your friend Terry happens to randomly walk into the room, and if you win the bet, you know, you gave a, a, your coin to, to Brad, um, Terry will give you two coins. <laughs> so, so you, you win the cake and then you actually kind of, you're ahead in terms of coinage too, because, you know, he, he gave you two coins and you, you originally just had one. And so now we have multiple causes happening, right? The coin flipped uh, impacts who eats the cake um the the coin flip the coin flip influences whether or not you have to give the coin to Brad um and then then you know whether or not Terry enters the room and you win or lose the bet will influence whether or not you get additional money um so just just to summarize here a variable can cause multiple things right coin flip caused money and cake here um and a variable can be caused by multiple uh, additional variables. In this case, money was influenced by both the coin flip um, and whether or not Terry was in the room. And uh, there, there could in fact be complex interactions. I think in this case, there is an interaction, right? Um, between what, what Terry does, depending on the outcome of the coin flip. Um, so there are complex interactions that are not necessarily detailed, uh, are not clearly evident in the DAG itself. Okay, we move on to unobserved variables. Uh, the, the idea with a DAG is you should include anything that's relevant to your data generating process, whether or not you can see them, whether or not you can measure them, whether or not you really know what that variable is. If you just know about it, if it's a known unknown and it's significant, it should be included in your, your DAG setup. And um, I'm trying not to include too many code examples here, but I did want to give one more example because this one's more complex. Um, and, and we'll walk through this, but throughout the book, when there's an unobserved variable, what the author did was he grayed out the, the node, right? That was, was the unobserved or latent variable. And then he would also 
gray out the related edge. Um, it looks like, at least with the GG DAG package, the, the more common thing to do is, is just associate a different color uh, with the uh, unobserved variable. And, and so, you know, th this is a, a bit lengthier, uh, a little harder to digest, but it's pretty easy. I found like a similar code example online in Stack Overflow um, where you can just easily assign different colors to, to different nodes. So just an FYI, if, if you're going to draw DAGs going forward, this might be useful for you. Um, but let's talk about this specific example. Um, we're still dealing with the coin flip and cake. Um, but but now we're assuming that Terry doesn't come into the room in a random fashion. It's based on his mood. Um, and, you know, let's just assume mood is not something that's readily measurable. Um, Terry has a, has a poker face too. So let's assume we can't just read his face. Um, and so this is, again, very similar to the previous DAG, although now, you know, mood, Terry's mood, which we don't see, is influencing whether or not Terry influence, influences whether or not Terry comes into the room, whether or not Terry is part of that, you know, situation in the room will, it will uh, uh, then, you know, influence whether or not we get additional money back, depending on the outcome of our, of our bet. So we're getting a little bit more complex here. Um, and then there's just one other example. I, I, I don't include the code here because, you know, I think it's, it's a bit redundant. Uh, but this is going back to the ice cream and shorts uh, thing that we've, we've gone back to multiple times now. Um, kind of a, a, a classic example where, you know, there's not a cause and effect relationship, but there is a correlation. Um, you know, let, we, we, we kind of know what the unobserved variable is in this case, but let's just assume we didn't, right? There, there's something out there that's causing folks to both wear shorts and eat ice cream. Um, uh, in this case, uh, the unknown or unobserved latent variable is, is a nice, warm, humid weather, right? Uh, that are going to influence both of these items. Just uh, a note of caution that the author puts out there is sometimes uh, you'll see folks, they, they won't explicitly uh, put a latent variable out there in the DAG, but instead they'll draw these double arrows uh, between two observable variables. Um, I, I don't have it drawn here, but, um, and then in other cases, you'll just see an edge uh, between two observed variables with no arrows. Um, but that still um, is a way to suggest that there's an unobserved uh, variable um, at play here. Um, I, I personally like what the author is doing here with explicitly listing the unobserved variables. But just, you know, note of caution out in the wild, you may see a, a different uh, formulation for, for these DAGs. Okay, uh, we're doing on time. We got about 20 minutes here. Uh, the next section is a real life scenario. I found this one to be pretty pretty interesting. Uh, you know, let's assume our research question is how does the effect of police presence, you know, the, the relative size of your police force influence crime rates? And the expectation here uh, a priori would be that the more police you have, the, the lower your crime rate's gonna be. Uh, but in this example, and I need to clean up my, my R markdown a little bit, sorry about that. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, there's kind of the, the opposite situation happening where the the more police you have, the the higher the crime rate is at least that's what what it looks like just just on a on a bivariate plot we know those can be misleading due to um, other uh, variables uh, involved other other uh, correlations um, interactions etc and so um, we try to draw the 
data generating process here in, the, in a DAG, and this is more complicated than what we've seen in the in the past. Um, so it's not as clear cut as just police per capita influencing the crime rate. Um, now we have a direct link with lagged crime. So maybe crime last year influences the, the crime this year. Um, and then we have these unobservable variables here that are influencing crime rates as well. Um, we have law and order politics, um, you know, stereotyping here, but right, you think of the more conservative party as, as being um, pr pr promoting law and order uh, more so than, than say a, a more liberal party. Um, and, and so, you know, that could influence um, the, the, the amount, whoever's in, in, in power, like what parties in power could influence the, the level of the police force, um, which could, it could then also influence crime. Um, so that's not necessarily a, a direct link there, but there is influence there. And then also there's another path where, you know, law and order politics ha has an, has an impact on the sentencing laws in addition to the police force size. Um, and so those sentencing laws, um, influence criminal behavior based on the, the risk and reward <laughs> calculation that criminals do, um, which also has an influence on the crime rate. Um, and then this, this expected uh, crime payout also is unobservable. It's, it's again, that risk reward uh, formulation that, that criminals are doing there, um, which will influence the, the, the crime rate as well. And so we, we learned about this last week. You, you need to be careful with any variables that influence both your intervention variable and your outcome variable. Um, and, and we, you know, the lag crime does influence both in this diagram. Um, and then we have law and order politics also influences police per capita directly and then indirectly crime rates uh, as well. So uh, this is, a prelude for a, a, a future chapter, but um, we're going to have to control for these these items that that are influencing both both the the inter intervening variable and the and the outcome. Another interesting point is uh, what you don't include your in your DAG is just as important about with with what is actually included. Uh, so, few examples of items that were not listed here that probably are relevant here, poverty rate, right? Uh, I think, you know, just, just from anyone that reads news stories, you know, we, we know that there's at least a correlation there between, you know, high poverty rate and, and high crime rates. Um, that may be something that we'd want to incorporate in our DAG. Maybe through prior research, we, we, we know there's a, a, a causal relationship there. We, we can make that uh, safe assumption uh, uh, and that could, could certainly in influence what, what's happening in our in our DGP. Uh, we also didn't see the lagged crime rate in our diagram. That might be something we want to throw in there. The uh, silly example, uh, you know, folks that have watched a recent crime movie, maybe that influences crime. Uh, maybe there's a, a movie where uh, the criminal is a uh, the protagonist and we sympathize with with him or her. And so <laughs> maybe crime rates go up or something because some folks are watching this movie. Um, that one probably isn't as relevant, but you can certainly think of that as, as being a possible um, item that would influence uh, the, the whole process here. Uh, and then finally, in our diagram, the, the we, we don't see lagged police per capita. We, we only have kind of current um, police presence. So, so might want to introduce kind of what happened in previous periods as also influencing the, the process overall. All right, so to, to finish off this section, uh, there's just some commentary that you need to balance simplicity and complexity. Um, there's a tendency for researchers to overthink the situation, include too much. If you, if you include too many variables in your diagram, you're never going to um, answer the the research question. So you need to pare it down as, as much as possible. Like there's this rule of parsimony that you want to abide by. Um, on the other hand, if you're too simple, you risk misidentifying your problem. And then, you know, any, any conclusions that you um, 
come up with statistically maybe are bunk are, are not valid because your assumptions are wrong. So uh, th this is just an, an idea that we we visited last week as well. Like it, it is a balancing act and it's uh, it can be hard. Uh, so moving on to section four of chapter six, uh, I, I pretty much already covered this one uh, earlier, the, the revisiting of this this police presence and crime um, example. And, you know, again, we are interested in, in police, um, relative police presence and, and crime. We're not interested in these other things that influence police force size and, and, and crime rates. Um, and interesting call out here is we may be interested in this direct influence of police and, and crime rates. Um, but there's in this diagram, there's also an indirect uh, effect as well, which takes you from police force size to, you know, the, the risk reward uh, calculation from from criminals to to crime rates. So that's an indirect effect. And um, depending on your research question, you may be only interested in that direct effect, or you may be interested in both of them. Uh, so I, like, we don't really get too deep on this subject in the chapter, but I assume that's that's going to be a topic of interest um, later on as we we learn more. Uh, so, but an interesting call out there. There are. Uh, methods out there where you can tease out direct only, or maybe the, the total uh, the total effect there, including the indirect uh, effects that are part of your process. Uh, we we mentioned earlier uh, that in this case we we have these confounding variables: law and order politics uh, and lagged crime rate. They influence both both the intervening variable uh, and the outcome. So we need to control for those and. Uh, you know, we're still at this conceptual stage of our, but in the future, we're going to want to dig into, uh, you know, how, how to do this through, through statistical controls and, and methodologies. Any questions on this piece here? All right, uh, we'll move on to the last section which uh, deals with what are called moderators. Um, I was somewhat familiar with this term, but it, it's, it's definitely not something uh, that I have used on a on a day-to-day -day basis here. Um, just just cutting to the chase here, when you think of the term moderators, I would suggest that you also think of the term interaction. It's really, we're talking about interaction effects here. And, and that, that's maybe a more comfortable term for me um, coming from more of a, a statistical background, but not necessarily a social science background where the, the term moderator is more commonly used. Um, and so let's let's just start with another another dag here. We have uh, a couple variables uh, that influence uh, our outcome, why. And again, I need to clean up my my R mark down a little bit. I have a little bit of a run on situation going on, but uh, assume X in, like X in this case is fertility drug. It influences whether or not someone gets pregnant. So that's an X to Y cause and effect relationship. Um, but then you also have, you know, whether or not a person has a uterus um, that will uh, also influence whether or not you can get pregnant but then there's there's a bit of an interaction effect going on there too, uh, right? With with the fertility drug because the fertility drug won't work if you don't have a uterus. And interestingly enough, we we talked about how a DAG uh, doesn't give you all the details about what's going on. So so this particular DAG here could be represented by this is just four possible um, examples here, but but really you could come up with an infinite number. Uh, of ways to describe the relationships here. Um, the first one would just suggest that the the fertility drug and having a uterus are independent. They they both influence whether or not you can get pregnant. But but here you know it's just 0.2 times 
the, the fertility drug, right? Whatever you're measuring there, um, plus 0.3 times, do you have a, have a uterus? So it's a little, little interesting, maybe applied to this specific example, but you know, th this is one way you could think about it, just a, a linear relationship between these two um, variables. Um, but the relationship doesn't have to be linear. You could also think of a polynomial uh, where you take, you know, for instance, a squared term of, of one of the variables as well. Um, and then we get into uh, interaction effects, which again is really about uh, what, what moderation is, where yes, you have direct effects uh, from X to Y and, and Z to Y, but then you also have this interaction between X and Z. And so in this case, you would say that there's a moderating effect of X on Z, and, and, and then similarly, a moderating effect of Z on X. And in, in just a minute, we'll, we'll see a, an explicit diagram that would, would capture that. <clears throat> uh, and then finally, there's, a, there's another moderating uh, effect example where there is no direct link between Z and Y, uh, but there is still an interaction with with X and X and Z. Um, so there's there's still a, a moderating a, a effect at play, and so uh, the the DAG that we're seeing here, th this basic uh, DAG is I guess the canonical way to describe any of these relationships, including when there are these interaction or moderating effects. Um, but the author doesn't like that, and, and his suggestion is, hey, let's let's be a little bit more explicit um, whenever there are moderating effects at play. Um, so, so this is again not necessarily a traditional way to go about it. But um, what we can do is, again, this this third equation here, we can represent that with the the moderating the the interaction effect here. Uh, explicitly with another node. So that's X and Z. So that's the interaction of those two variables together where you know you still have the direct influence of, of X on Y, Z on Y. Um, but there's also you know Z, Z affects Y through this interaction, X affects Z through this interaction. And then the interaction effect itself has has some bearing on on the overall value of Y. So we're being really e explicit about what's going on here. Um, it, you know, much, much clearer way to describe the situation. And then equation four is very similar, except here we don't have uh, a direct link uh, between Z and Y, but there is an inter interaction effect between X and Z. So we say Z has an interaction Z has an, a moderating influence on X through this this interaction. Um, you know, we, we continue to see the direct influence of X and Y, and then you know X gets moderated from Z through the interaction, and, and that would also influence Y as well. So um, yeah, long story short, we can be a little bit more explicit in capturing these moderating influences uh, to help folks, uh, you know, get it get a better understanding of, of what's going on here. Just, just a random thought on this this fourth situation here. I always think about just my statistical upbringing, right? Um, where they always say like, don't include an interaction term unless you're also incorporating the primary effect as well, um, unless you have a really strong theoretical reason to do so. Um, you know, you think about like p-values. <laughs> Even if your if your your regression model says you know, you have a, a high p-value for maybe the primary effect of z on y, but you you do have an like a strong interaction for x on z. You'd still want to keep that primary uh, effect in your model. Just just something that I thought about as as we were thinking through that that fourth example there. Um, this would seem to kind of go against traditional statistical approaches. Um, I don't know if any other folks thought about that as well. And it's kind of a similar thing when you have like a polynomial term, right? Like the general rule of thumb is if you have a pol like a square term, you also want to include the, the primary effect uh, as well. Even if your statistical model is telling you that 
you know, that, that, that first level effect is not significant. Um, you generally, you would still keep it in there if you are kind of going with the, the higher level effect as well. Um, and that I believe is it. The key takeaway here is that, uh, again, moderators really are all about interaction. So that's again, the more familiar term, uh, for me, um, and that really hit home. Um, in understanding what we're talking about when we use the, the, the term moderator. And, uh, you know, we have just a few minutes left. I, I don't think that's enough to really go into some of the homework examples. So um, any other last thoughts on this chapter? Um, you know, what are folks thinking, excited to go into? Uh, some of these later chapters, it, it seems like we're we're still going to be uh, staying in this high level conceptual world for uh, a few more chapters before we get into the the meat and potatoes of uh, part two, where we we get into the tools, um, which is I, I don't know what what I'm really excited about <laughs> more more than the the high level stuff, but um, you know just reinforcing what I've already learned about DAGs and and I'm learning new stuff here as well. I, I think this is this is kind of cool cool stuff to talk about. Um, so I've, I've enjoyed it um, so far. I, I do like how the DAGs really provide us with a high level visual uh, view for others to understand kind of what we're assuming, right? When we're um, conducting our research. Awesome, thank you, Aaron. Are Not there a problem. Any questions, discussions, anything anyone wants to uh, uh, discuss before we close out for today? Well, it, Aaron did a really great job, and uh, hopefully you all are now excited to dive deeper into causal diagrams, because next week we'll actually be drawing these. And as you're going through about kind of how to read them and understand them, one of the resources that were on there was actually one where they put puzzles out there, causal diagrams, and you can kind of it ask you like a question like, how to read them or stuff. So it's kind of cool practice, but that's what we're going to be focusing on uh, next week is actually drawing these and uh, I'll be following what is used in the book or the resources there, but it does sound like it's gonna be, if not the same that you're using, it's very similar to it because that package was part of the recommended resource, but that will be for next week. And um, let me just double check if I believe we had one person sign up, I don't know if it was next week or two weeks out, let me just double check. So we have Sarah signed up for casual paths and closing back doors in chapter eight for the 28th. Um, if you have any interest in nine, 10 or 11, uh, those are our last three weeks for the conceptual part of it before we dive into the toolbox starting in chapter 12. So uh, please ask if you have any interest or desire or topics of, that you wanna dive deeper in, uh, please sign up the volunteer. Otherwise, thank you all for participating and uh, I'll go ahead and it's tough and we'll see you all next week. Take care.